Hey everyone, Chris here. Thanks for checking out the podcast. If you're enjoying it and learning something along with us, please consider becoming a supporting patron at patreon.com slash a teacher history. Or you could leave a rating and review on iTunes. It would be a huge help. If you'd like to raise your hand and participate along with us, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, at a teacher fist, or shoot me an email, chris at a teacher history.com. All right, let's get on to the next episode. All right, everyone, this is a bonus episode that I did on the, I was a guest on the podcast, History That Doesn't Suck, which is also a narrative history of the United States. It's a bit of a different style than um, a teacher's history of the United States and doesn't go into quite as much detail, but it's absolutely fantastic. Um, It is hosted by Professor Greg Jackson, um, who is on Twitter at at prof. Greg Jackson, and uh, you can also follow the podcast tours page by at HTDF pod or check them out on history that doesn't suck.com. If you've been listening to the episodes here throughout the course of this podcast, you may remember from episode 78 where I had Greg on talk about the Constitutional Convention. Well, uh, he returned the favor and had me on to talk to his audience about the antebellum period. Um, we recognize that while we, when we recorded this at the time of recording, I was in the Monroe administration. He was in the middle of the Civil War. So uh, for his listeners, it's sort of a look back at the things that led to the Civil War and, and connecting how they, they continue to impact uh, America post-Civil War. And for you guys, it's sort of a peak, of he- peak ahead. Um, we purposefully did not have too much of an agenda here. We had a bunch of topics that we were interested in and wanted to talk about, and it was just two really big fans of U.S. history who both do a U.S. history podcast just sitting down and talking about the antebellum period and U.S. history. Um, we both are throwing it up. It's a bonus episode in our feed, and I will probably actually repost it right before we get into the Civil War, too, as some of this stuff, if, if you're not really familiar with the antebellum period, some of the stuff we talk about might not resonate or make sense with you, but hopefully, uh, if I repost it right at the beginning of the Civil War, it will make a lot more sense. So, um, without further ado, we'll just dive right into the conversation. Thanks. Hey everyone, welcome to a bonus episode of History That Doesn't Suck. So this is Greg, of course, and you are able to expect the usual story-driven episode that will come out on the usual schedule. Uh, But here today, I am joined by Chris Caldwell, who is the host of a teacher's... uh, Chris, I just about botched your podcast name. (laughs) A teacher's history of the United States. It's a mouthful, just like yours, yeah. I know. It's where we've embraced this HTDS business. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. You know, Game of Thrones, they went to GOT eventually, mm-hmm. right? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 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 I've, yeah, I've tried realize. it out. Yeah. Oh, have you? Yeah. A-T-U-S or something, but yes. I don't know. Yeah. No. Well, at any rate, Chris, it is a pleasure to uh, to have you here. Yeah, it's good. It's good to be on the podcast, man. I know that we um, we did a bonus episode, like collaboration on my podcast, a little bit ago that I thought was great. Um, my audience really enjoyed it, so I'm I'm thankful for the opportunity to hop on yours and talk a little bit about um, antebellum U.S. history and uh, get into the story of the start of the Civil War, and because I know that's where you are now. I'm still yep, on in, in the midst of it. Yep, yep, yeah, yeah. You're right in the middle of it, and uh, I'm still on. Gosh, I just started Monroe um, in my podcast, um, so we're we're sort of meeting in the middle a little bit, and uh, I think well, uh, it, there's some good if, stuff if, here. If you'll allow me to uh, indulge in telling my audience just a little bit more about you, sure, yeah. Um, you, you, your history. Both of us are doing the, the history of the United States. Um, yours is insanely detailed at least that's how i like to think of it okay you you've you've got how many episodes uh, so we're on episode 114 
And yep. I'm doing re- this will be episode 114 on my feed. And right now I'm doing research on the election of 1824 and the corrupt bargain between John Quincy Adams and Andrew Jackson. Right. So here I am around, you know, my 60th yep. and we're in the Civil War. Yeah. So, you know, just just kind of a little checkpoint, I guess. You could yeah. Say. They, they've just different flavors of history. And um, one, exactly. one thing I've come to find is that. Uh, people who love history love history, and people who love politics love politics, and people who love sports love sports. And so there's no right or wrong way to do it. And uh, we talked, you know, in, in our prep for this episode about how we've taken different approaches, and it's working for both of us. And um, I, I love I love your show. Um, it, it's definitely different than mine in in a lot of good ways, and a lot of just very different ways. And uh, I appreciate it, and I learn something when I listen to yours too. So. Um, and now yeah. that you're ahead of me, you're doing, you know, some of the story te- storytelling for me. So I appreciate that. <laughs> Happy to have you crib yeah. if, uh, if that ever helps. Yeah. Well, um, I, I, I guess we won't, uh, not that we're boring the people. I, I, I uh, don't, don't want to time to dive about in. what I yeah. do, I guess, you know, let, well, let, yeah, let's go ahead and dive on in. Yep. So we talked about, you know, you being at Monroe, me being at, uh, the civil war, kind of marrying our, our two points and just talking through uh, things in a way that will set up your listeners um, and, and be a good reflection for mine on some some of these major events. Uh, just help people kind of catch the the forest in case in case we've taken them too close yeah. to where they're just seeing the trees. Yeah. So yeah? so I think I think in an ideal world, you, you and I could have come on probably uh, two, three months ago and, and done this in, in a perfect world. But when we were talking about it, we were saying that you know, there, there's a lot of value. Since you're at the Civil War, I'm at uh, 1824. A lot happens in those 40 years-ish uh, leading up to the war that will set the stage and I think is worth a broader discussion for the societal, political, and economic trends that will uh, endure throughout the war and then continue after the war. And I think in the direction that you're going when you move into Reconstruction and trying to rebuild and bring the nation back together following the war, there will be a lot of themes and a lot of things that people will be able to pick up on that were prevalent before the war that continue after the war. And so I think there's a lot of value in reviewing some of that and rehashing it and maybe getting into some details and conversations that um, you haven't in your podcast or I wouldn't um, necessarily potentially in mine. And for my podcast, it's like a way to look forward. Yeah, a little little sneak peek. Yep, absolutely. Well, let's go ahead and do this. And um, you know, I'll, I'll freely, I, I will freely admit that uh, th- this is a little fun and a little scary. In that we're going to be, I mean, we organized, we we got our thoughts together. We literally just spoke for an hour before we even hit the record yeah. button. But I think we're embracing just kind of letting this conversation go where where it goes between two historians here. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, and I think that's sort of the, the best way to do it. The way I was thinking about it is, you know, when, when you look at the North and the South and you think about the Civil War and obviously the battles are incredibly valuable and to, to know about and they're impactful. And, you know, one of my co-hosts, Zach, would argue with me all day long that it's actually all supply lines and logistics, but that's really boring stuff. Um, and I know <laughs> okay. I know you're really into stories, but I think under, yeah. understanding some of the broader perspectives on on why it came to this, uh, why yeah. you had Americans fighting Americans, and yes, the short answer is slavery, but there's so much more to it than that, and there's so many layers. While, while slavery is really the correct answer, there's so many layers below that that underpin what makes slavery uh, made slavery so critical. Um, as of an issue leading up to the Civil War, during the Civil War, and then you have the um, sharecropping and basically the re-enslavement of many African Americans after the Civil War in the South. Absolutely. Uh, I don't. I'm curious, Chris, if you've had the same experience. Sure. You know, obviously, I learned I learned a thing or two going through that whole education process: the bachelor's, master's, PhD, blah blah blah. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and frankly, I hope so. Or what was I paying that tuition for? Yeah. But uh, going through the process of writing each of these episodes, I know yours is also research intensive. Yep. You're revisiting things you've taught in the classroom a million times over, yep. right? And yet, I, every time I'm I'm writing an episode, it's not that I walk away uh, going, "Oh, I was." I was incorrect about this thing previously, you, but I walk away with such a, a 
and you know, it, it depends on, on the topic. Some things, of course, you come to with more knowledge than, than another, but I come away with a deeper understanding of, well, just of, of both sides. Um, and, and not in a, both sides are always equal, you know, yep. in terms of their morality mm-hmm. or the position, but just going, oh my gosh, th- that's why yeah. it came to blows. Yeah. Like, and and, I, and and look, I, th- I think one thing that's really important to keep in mind when we study history, and especially when we study conflicts and we study wars and we study something like the Civil War that uh, is as nightmarish as possible when it comes to some of the experiences of um, African slaves and even, even African-American freedmen um, in certain states prior to, during, and after the war, is that the human beings do things – for their reasons, and they do things. Their their the chemical systems in their bodies prompt them to do things for what they feel in the moment is the right reason. Now we can always take a step back and realize that, like, oh well, yeah, that was not right. That was abhorrent. That was terrible. That was horrible. But um, for the most part, what people will do is they'll make a decision and then they'll justify the decision, and then they'll continue to see the world from that perspective. And that personal reality that they view through their eyes will create their personality, which will only then continue to um, propagate that personal reality for them to the point where they can't see the forest from the trees. And they genuinely don't understand how you could see it another way. And you get a lot of that leading up to the Civil War that causes blows because two-thirds of um, freed white Men, women, free white people in the South uh, did not have anything to do with slavery. They didn't own slaves. Um, They didn't have plantations. They weren't related to any slave owners. They were yeoman farmers, and they they were just laborers. Uh, But what you— Yeah. By by not having anything to do, you mean as as in, you know, they're not— Directly they're, involved, yeah. Right. Yep. I mean, I I just want to add that little n- nuance, Absolutely, right? Yeah. Not. I totally took your point. Yep. Just want to you know, clarify. Think, it's, yeah. It's and, and, and inside I think, that slave economy. And, and I and I think I, I think throughout this conversation, it's good to have the um, the context of the, things like this are really hard to talk about, right? Oh, absolutely. Um, and, and it's, <laughs> yeah. it's especially difficult for for us to talk about given our demographic. Um, in that, in that we don't like some of the injustice that still exists today that permeates itself throughout our society because of the hundreds of years of African slavery in the United States, we don't have to deal with as directly as uh, many African Americans do. So there, um, with some of these subjects, it's extremely difficult to have the conversation and try to look at it as objectively as possible and analyze it from purely an analytical standpoint without recognizing that like this is a really sensitive topic. Yeah. And in no way are we trying to um, justify, explain away or um, legitimize anything that should not be justified, explained away or legitimized. Um, but the the problem, and you understand this being being a historian yourself, is that once you fall into the, um, but this was wrong, and then you just stay there, which is true. It's one hundred percent wrong. But then you have to think, but hold on a second. Why did? But why did they do it? Because yeah, people I, don't aren't born to just want to do bad things. So what led them to? hang on so tight to this. And that's where it becomes really interesting. Well, yeah, I think a, an important principle, and I, I've said this to my students in the classroom many times, is that uh, understanding is not the same as condoning. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so there's there's this space that we need to be able to get into uh, where we can understand that the past is really a different world. Yeah. And that's, that's not condoning what's going on um, just as future generations are not going to condone everything that, that we're doing, though they're going to look back on us with 2020 hindsight, and they're going to be able to better see some of the things that we might be uh, partially blind to, completely blinded to, uh, and so forth. And, you know, that's, that's an important part of, of doing history. Yeah, a- absolutely. Um, and when we, well, well, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, I was just going to say, and when we think about when, when we think about this, um, we'll want to think about, and and the reason I brought that up, and I probably didn't articulate as well as I could have when I said two thirds of of Southern whites oh. weren't involved; they weren't directly involved. But the the point I was trying to make there is that they took up arms for it anyway. 
right? In right. the end, they, they fought for it and they died for it and they lost well, and, family members over it. So you have to think about like, hold on a second, what's going on here? Um, what, what did slavery mean to the society as a whole uh, yeah. that went beyond just the men who own the slaves? Because as you know, it's a rich man's war and a poor man's fight. It, we literally just covered. I know. I know. <laughs> yeah, you're, why, you're, that, you're ripping that, off of that last episode. I, that's that's yeah. why I'm winking at you. Yeah, I love yeah, it. See, I, I, know. Listen, I listen. Sadly, the yeah, the, uh, <laughs> the, the the listeners can't see our our uh, Zoom video. Oh yeah, I can catch that wink. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, these are these are all very rich issues uh, that that have to be fully explored. So, um, you know, I uh, I think if we go back, you know, a few decades and to kind of connect more to the era that you're mm-hmm. in. If we, We'll go ahead and make that make that leap now. Uh, I guess one of my immediate thoughts, and you'll just have to forgive me because my mind goes here, and we totally didn't talk about this. See, we're gonna just follow the conversation where it goes. All right. Uh, is that uh, you know I'm not trying to, th- to throw stones by any means, mm-hmm. but that the North does still have slavery, and I, yep. I think we forget about that. That uh, even though there are uh, laws in place that are bringing about the end of slavery. So, and that's, at, uh, I wouldn't say it's probably worth our, our time and means to go through this on a state by state basis, but, um, different states have different years in which if someone is born enslaved, they are now going to be emancipated at maybe 25 years old or in a different state, it's 30 years old and, and so forth. And so it, this is slowly, uh, getting rid of slavery. And we tend to think of these as free states. Uh, but I, I feel like one of the misnomers that is sometimes lost on Americans is this idea that the South had slavery, the North never had slavery, which is just factually incorrect. Uh, their different economies uh, push the development of slavery in different directions, and uh, the North was able to divorce itself in a very slow process. It's not like when it did end it that you know everyone was instantly uh, freed who was enslaved, and even at the time of the Civil War, uh, there. I mean, we're talking. Oh, what's the exact number? I think it's under a hundred even, but there are still a very, very few um, black Americans that are enslaved in what we consider, you know, the, the North, not border. Uh, oh, maybe that is still in the border state, but at any yeah. rate. Uh, no, no, I, I understand what you're saying. And I think that, you know, one, one thing that's interesting and can fare there, right, is that there were some slaves in, in northern states, what, what we, you would view as states that belong to the Union. And, of course, as you know, which you've gotten into, once you get into the Civil War, you, you have those genuine border states that, like, I live in a border state, um, right. Maryland. Maryland fought for the Union. I can tell you from growing up on the eastern shore of Maryland in the farmland peninsula, there are a lot of slaves there. That's where Frederick Douglass was born. Um, that's where Harriet Tubman was born. And so, you know, although they live most of their lives somewhere else. So I, I think that one thing you mentioned is this idea of gradual emancipation. And this is, I, I think that there there can be some real ties here for your listeners because you're right in the throes of the Civil War. And you, and you recognize the bloodshed and the carnage that's been going on and will continue to go on in the name of ending slavery. And that really was what the primary purpose of the war was about. But leading up to the Civil War, most Northerners, whether it was the free soilers, um, some of the know-nothings who, who were in favor of ending slavery, soon to be the Republican Party, the Northern Democrats, they were for the most part in favor of eman- e- um, eventual emancipation, um, not immediate emancipation. They were much, or right. I should gradual. Ah, that's the word I'm looking for. There gradual, we are. <laughs> right? They were they were much more in favor of gradual emancipation. So even William Lloyd Garrison, the publisher of the Liberator, who's the most famous abolitionist in American history, um, outside probably Frederick Douglass, who may may be the best order ever in American history. Um, and by the way, no Lloyd, kidding. William Lloyd <laughs> William Lloyd Garrison is the one that discovered Frederick Douglass, and and helped bring him to fame. But William Lloyd Garrison initially was actually for uh, gradual emancipation. So that that's – and that's, I think, important to recognize is that many of the northerners and even the abolitionists recognize that it's going to um, likely be the best approach for gradual emancipation. But he, here's the issue, right? 
eventually men like William Lloyd Garrison around the 1820s, actually I'm doing an episode on 1824 now in The Corrupt Bargain, and in that year the state of Ohio wrote a resolution that the legislature proposed to open a conversation to the southern states about eventual gradual emancipation, and it got so flatly rejected and thrown back in their face that they began to realize that, oh, yeah, this is – they're not open to conversations about this. Um, we're not going to be able to negotiate something. Uh, I think we may have to get a bit, a bit more um, immediate and radical with this, and, and that's sort of what uh, – how the uh, abolitionist movement was really born, especially with many whites in the North, right? Uh, many African Americans in the North, you could uh, freed or escaped slaves in the North. You can understand the, the emotional pull, obviously, for them. But for many whites right. in the North, it was like, oh, wait, we can't do this in a gradual way. Okay, we're going to push for it more and more. Um, well, yeah, and, and I think that something we, we often forget is uh, that abolitionism the you know th- then it, it was a radical idea initially that yeah. this is something only fringe people would uh, would believe it, it, it again is one of those things that kind of gets washed over when we think about north and south and people fall into thinking oh the north the free states where no one wanted slavery and you know these are these are broad and frankly incorrect uh, concepts of pre-civil war uh, northern america uh, their uh even though there are abolitionists, it's really not until the 1820s, 1830s, as you just laid out, they're considered radicals. Mm-hmm. Uh, we can, you know, I mentioned on on my podcast, I'm trying to call, I mean, I, I know you talked about Otis, um, but, uh, you know, the the Bostonian revolutionary, he makes a mention, and, and that's part of where you can even see just how deep and how long, you know, the, the discussion, debate over slavery within uh, a republic that's conceived in liberty, you know, is, is going on. He makes a mention that, well, as we, you know, as we're talking about rights that we have as as Englishmen, by the way, black or white, anyone in these colonies should should have those rights. Uh, he's, I guess, I just want to underline just how ahead of his time yeah. he was. You know, yeah. even as you see that tension playing out, it really takes until the 1830s for people to be considered radicals as mm-hmm. they start talking about full on abolitionism. Yeah, and and you're right because there really wasn't uh the abolitionist movement, the idea of actually abolishing slavery as opposed to gradually ending it over time or allowing it to end naturally over time. Like Daniel Webster was a guy who just thought that eventually it would end because the there right. wouldn't be enough soil and yada yada yada, the climate environment wouldn't allow it, but um, a yeah, a somewhat popular, you know, enough yep. popular enough view that, yep. that was held by many. Yeah, but once you once you get to 1860 and uh, 61, and you get Fort Sumter, and you realize that while that's going down, the South is literally booming with cotton and <laughs> right. and more profitable than it had ever been. You're like, well, I mean, maybe it would have ended, but uh, it's certainly not tracking toward that. No. Um, and you know, you know, Ken, Kendall C. Wright is is a leadership consultant, uh, and and I follow a lot of his stuff ju- just uh, personally. And he has a quote that I love that I think about a lot: um, "What you ignore becomes more. What you tolerate will take over, and what you challenge will change." And with when you hmm. think about that quote in the perspective of anything that's allowed to go on in your life or, or your job, but when we think about it here with slavery, um, the issue of slavery was ignored. It it was brought up in conversations at the writing of the Articles of Confederation. It was brought up at the writing of the Constitution. Well, um, even the Declaration of Independence, Declaration right? of Independence, you know, yep. And, mm-hmm. and then it, it, it struck out. Yep. I um, mean, I mean, uh, the, Britain was trying to recruit slaves during the Revolutionary War because they recognized the opportunity there, uh, and it kept coming up. Right. It came up in the in the Missouri Compromise of eighteen twenty, well, and, and, and and not to uh, you know throw stones at our at our British friends. I think it is important the way you said it, right? The, the opportunity they recognized. Yep. It's not that they were, um, you know, a bunch of diehard abolitionists themselves. Yeah. They wanted to win point. a war. Yeah, they, yeah. they exactly. Yeah. Um, but I apologize. I mean, you, you're on a roll, and I no, I no. But I, I, I think, I think that's good to bring up. I mean, British abolition plays a big role in that too, because Britain abolishes 
slavery dur- during this time period. And once they do it, all of a sudden, America doesn't have – the South doesn't have a moral equivalency they can point to. And what really begins to drive a wedge in a lot of this, as I'm sure you can recognize, especially when you think about politics, right? When something is criticized, a viewpoint is criticized, a lifestyle is criticized, condemned, um, demeaned, um, what has a tendency to happen if people take it very, very personally? So in the, in the South, when we're talking about – so if, if we think about westward expansion, right, and the Mexican-American War, um, which you've already covered, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo and the additional land that was, that was gained there – and as, as we talk about, the fight to not allow westward expansion into this region was headed up by the Free Soilers and then eventually the Republican Party. And what many Southerners felt at this time is that, wait, if you don't allow slavery in this western territory, like forget the practical reasons for why we want that to happen. We need it to spread. We need the economy to keep growing. We need the houses in the Senate, the House of Represent. We need the seats in the Senate, the House of Representatives, et cetera. Right, and in terms of yeah. balance of power, yep. free mm-hmm. versus slave uh, state. Right? Yep, absolutely. And but what there, there's also a deeper um, social and uh, identity role type of perspective here. In that, if you're saying slavery is not good enough for the West, if you're saying slavery is too morally corrupt for the West and too morally corrupt for you, then what does that make us? And that type of that type of perspective was very prevalent in the South. And what that does is that creates right or wrong, right? It's just their perspective. Um, right or wrong, that creates some deep-seated resentment and bitterness for the uh, Southerners who view many Northerners as the holier-than-thou Northerners who were lecturing them on how to live a good life and, and get to heaven, et cetera, et cetera, who always acted like they had the moral high ground. And um, we know that you know they did have the moral high ground. But uh, <laughs> from the perspective of, of a Southerner, you can see why, um, if they're living in their box, right, why that could frustrate them. Um, and, and lead them toward more and more animosity over time, right? Um, and uh, you know, and, and we see that playing out in a number of acts. Um, maybe we should, maybe we can go yeah. ahead and connect it out yeah. a little bit. Yeah, sure. Um, well, and, and then I like to also connect to you know s- some of what what you're saying there. How we even see that in the personal lives of of different figures who you know then choose to go union or choose to go confederacy. Yeah, um, sure. I, I'd love to hear more about that. I, I know that you you know a lot about that, and um, and have done your research on that stuff. So I'd love to, I'd love to touch on that too. So well, if you, yeah. Oh, sorry. No, by all means, we'll kill each other with politeness. You no, go no, th- th- no. This is great. I mean, this is. Um, I, I I'm really enjoying this because it's just two guys talking about talking about history and and things we're passionate about, and we're just going wherever wherever the conversation leads us. But I I was thinking, do you um do you want to just start exploring some of the some of the events that played out and some of the things that played into this culminating in the Civil War and, and then what that would mean as we move move through it and uh, continue to look at America after it. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, you, you touched on the Compromise of, of 1820, Missouri Compromise. Um, and, you know, this is um, yet, yet another attempt to kind of just put a big Band-Aid over mm-hmm. this yeah. friction. Um, yeah. I mean, Thomas Jefferson said um, it, it It was, uh, I man, see, now I'm blanking on his exact quote, but he, he basically saw this as just kicking the can down the road. and Which uh, we can see, you know, in hindsight, yeah, it, absolutely it was. was. But, yeah. you know, it's, I think when, maybe when some people think, geez, you know, why did we end up having a civil war? I'll tell you, as, I, as I've thought through the, the Missouri Compromise, and then you think about the land acquisition from the Mexican-American War, and then... We get to the Compromise of 1850, the Kansas-Nebraska Act. Man, I I see generations of Americans who truly tried to avoid a full-on total war, uh, and it's, you know it, it could it, it it seems that they just could not come to a, a resolution without resorting to it. Yeah, and I th- and I think that that's part of the problem, right? Anytime you have something as insidious as slavery, 
um, not just in a society and what it's doing to the society, but when you think about it this way, Greg, if you were or I were born um, in 1815 into a family in South Carolina, right, right. or in Savannah, Georgia, who owned slaves or who um, partook in the slave trade— And, like, that's all we knew, and that was our reality. And we were taught from a young age when we were, you know, taking in information without analyzing it, um, like kids do, right, that this is how the world is and this is how the world works and this is why. Uh, We see people today who are indoctrinated with hate today. And even though they have so much access to information with the Internet, with television, with, I mean, as much as they could possibly want— And getting over that indoctrination is extremely difficult. So what happens is because they keep kicking the can down the road, this pattern continues to uh, happen over and over, day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year. And it becomes more and more cemented in the minds of Southerners that somehow it is right or just or fair for them to continue to live this lifestyle. And then... um, they become more uh, adjusted to the lifestyle, more married to the lifestyle, and they can't view a world in which they would allow themselves to be separated or divorced from that lifestyle. So not only was the Missouri Compromise kicking the can down the road, but while they were really trying hard to prevent this, sometimes you just got to nip it in the bud, and that's what America was not able to do. Well, and that's what this is all tr- truly a sad tale. Um, you know, I I don't know how else to how else to even put it. It's, yeah, it, it is. It's it's a heartbreaking, um, you know, development. The the way that you you see the attempts to avoid bloodshed, um, and it, until you finally do get to the 1850s, where you know, as we're speaking about bloodshed, I. I'm inclined to now talk John Brown a little bit where, uh, mm-hmm. you know, we get to bleeding Kansas and, uh, the, it just seems like it's inescapable where, yeah. uh, you know, John essentially decides, you know, we, we, we've got, um, a scenario where slavery is going to continue spreading, uh, unless I take up the sword in a very literal sense. And he, you know, goes out and, takes a broadsword to a few pro-slavery neighbors. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, his, um, talking about botched quotes, I'll, I'll space his his last, well, not his last words, but the last words he wrote, right? There's a little scrap of paper he basically, you know, writes out and essentially, uh, you know, right before he, he goes out to his execution where he says, I just, I don't see how this, how slavery ends without without more bloodshed. Is. Yeah. You know, and, and I think we, we look at him as, I mean, he's certainly a figure who it was, uh, well, you know, if someone goes out and starts killing people because they don't agree with their ideology, but in today's world, I, I think we'd probably call, as much as we might agree with, you know, John being anti-slavery, in today's world, we call that person a terrorist. Yeah. Um, and, uh, or a, yeah, vigi- or a vigilante. Yes. Yeah. Uh, um, and, uh, you know, I, I found it as I got more and more into into his head, doing the research, you know, reading um, the writings of those around him, his own, that uh, this is a guy who really was in his in his way as he was shedding blood. He was hoping to avoid bloodshed. You know, he wanted to lead a slave rebellion, uh, hoping that this would kind of be a a quick and short thing. And it, it just seemed to me that his realization as he's being led to the gallows was that you know, the, basically the, the roots of this tree are deeper than I thought. And they will not be uprooted half as easily as I had hoped they would. Does that, that, that make yeah, any sense and, to you? Yeah, no, it absolutely does. And I think this brings us to a broader question. This is why I, I love conversations like these in, in which we're just sort of seeing where it goes. Because then it, it, at all times throughout our history, because one thing we want to make sure we think about is always looking at both sides and understanding that everyone's life experiences are different, right? right. And that there is no for, – <laughs> for almost – I know there's sort of sacrosanct saying, excuse me there, because I, <laughs> okay. I am, am obsessed with American history and I am a hardcore American patriot. But like 
just drawing right. up the American Revolution as like good guys versus bad guys, mm, not so accurate. Uh, and when we think about it, like how do we deal with revolutionary violence? When is revolutionary violence justified? When is revolutionary yeah. violence not ju- like at what point was the violence in Boston justified violence? When did it go from vigilante, law breaking, um, uh, unjustified violence to justified violence? And the crazy thing sure. is that's totally subjective. And each person makes that up in their own mind. So right. that's why John Brown's such a complicated figure because you don't know. You love his intentions, but it's like, I don't well, know. Could you have yeah, done it and, without murdering people? <laughs> like, you right. Know? Uh, you know, I, I guess, and I, I hope I'm coming across, I hope I'm coming across clearly there. Yeah. Uh, you know, if you turned on the news today, right, and, and there's some, uh, you know, you, you can fill in the blank with whatever hot topic issue you know, you, you want to, I'm sure anyone listening can, has already got something that's come to mind, even as I say that, yeah. and somebody has gone out and killed in the name of, of, um, you know, whatever that issue may be, uh, you know, I, I think that the opposition, uh, you know, news for lack of a better way to, to put that right. The, those, uh, news agencies that are opposed to whatever, uh, that person was, you know, doing, would in our 21st century terminology would use the word terrorist um you know j- just as w- when we look at the say the boston massacre right you went back mm-hmm. there to talk about that and i thought yeah you know i'm i'm right there with you i i am a sappy uh patriot on on the one hand um but of course i'm also a, a historian who has you know i who thinks it's crucial and and vital uh to uh you know, be to understand aware it, of, to of get all, right. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, to get yeah, right. To, to, to understand the context, to get inside yes. the heads of the people doing it. And, and what, what you, I'm sure you think about it all the time. And I think about it when I do this research is what would I have done? Oh, and absolutely. I always ask myself, I don't know what I would have done. Like, I'd like to think that I would have done all these great things. Well, then again, I'm the person who had the life that I had here in the, 20th and 21st century and so i'm a different person than i would have been 300 years ago i don't know what i would have done with a lot of this stuff you know thinking of the boston massacre you know the the boston gazette calls it a massacre but then the pamphlet that's published in uh in uh, london calls it you know the incident on king street (laughs) yeah like Uh okay so it was a policing incident or it was a massacre yeah. Right. And I mean, that's not even that far from I, I made this point back in episode three. That's not even that far from things we see, you know, today. Right. Yeah. Uh, you, you get you can get very different narratives on the same event. And yeah. uh, and that's exactly what we're seeing in this as the just as you you know put it riffing off of, of our dear friend Tommy J. You know, the can getting just kicked down the road yeah. and those different perspectives just ossifying more and more and more. Uh, yeah. Until we we get into the 1850s, and you know, there's there's John Brown uh, taking the broadsword, um, kind of a, a tit for tat starts to develop. You know, bloody Kansas is in some ways the, the first civil war. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, my mind also goes to the Lincoln Douglas debates, where now uh, for me, reading the transcripts of of those debates was a moment where uh, I. I remember the first time I read through those really kind of seeing, holy cow. I, I mean, I grasped on an intellectual level that, you know, slavery uh, is a deep seated, you know, main cause of, uh, of the civil war, but it's in, it's in that debate, you know, as I'm watching two watching, you know, reading through the transcripts of two men debating for a Senate seat, in a northern state for crying mm-hmm. out loud you, you know and and the discussion they're having and um lincoln another you know very simplified character uh, the more i get to know him the more i admire him and yet you know in, in the lincoln douglas debates it's not like he's he's not talking about abolition he's not an abolitionist he no he, he only ends up you know being able to be elected president in 1860 because he is not an abolitionist he's anti-slavery legitimately um but you know that that corner's yet to be turned, and so, you know, for me, it was in those in those debates or in Lincoln, you know, his his, uh, his speech uh, that you know, a house divided cannot stand. You can see how deeply the United States is talking and thinking through slavery in the 1850s, and with that type of rhetoric, I mean, yeah, 
So I think that I, I'm glad you brought up the House Divide Cannot Stand speech because that's such a critical speech in American history. Um, right up there with like David Webster's speech in the 7th of March for the Compromise of 1850. Apparently he went on for like three hours and it was one of the greatest speeches ever. And um, I, I can't remember which historian said it, but he said something along the lines of uh, guys who said that must have never heard Frederick Douglass speak. But, um, mm. but, uh, <laughs> but, but the, you bring up the House Divided speech. Right. And the yeah. House Divided speech happened right after the Dred Scott decision. So the, nice. Dred, so the Dred Scott decision had those three crucial um, uh, like decisions, I guess, for, for lack, of, <laughs> for, for lack sure. of a better, for lack of a more creative phrase. Hey, right? no, we're, we're all more eloquent when we have our scripts in front of us. Exactly. Right, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Microsoft Word is my friend. That's um, right. But, See, no uh, shame. No shame. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, you know, they, they said three, three different points, basically, in the decision. Number one, he can't sue in the first place because he's not a citizen. Right. Um, number, number two, uh, and, and Dred Scott, for those of you who, who aren't familiar with it or don't remember it, um, he was a slave that was moved temporarily for four years to a free state with his owner. And so he basically then said, well, I should be free now. If I live in a free state, how can I possibly be a slave? That doesn't make any sense. That's a paradox. That's and right. um, the Supreme and, Court and, said, actually, no. 1857, let's just get the, yep. the date yes. out there. Yeah, you know. sorry. Yeah. yeah. No, no, no worries. Yep. So, and, um, and it goes up to the Supreme Court. Go ahead, take it away. Yep. And Roger B. Tawney, um, who was a Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, unfortunately, yep. he was a Marylander, not super proud. Of, Cal Ripken, proud of <laughs> Roger B. Tawney, not so much. Um, good, good to know the local <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, okay. and and he basically said that the Missouri law is the one that follows you, which is, uh, you know, based on the Missouri Compromise, if you remember, Missouri was a slave state. Mm -hmm. And then he t they took it one step further. So the Supreme Court at this time was divided up. Um, what was it? Nine total Supreme Court justices. Five of right. them were slaveholders or former slaveholders before taking the job. So the uh, majority was already in favor of Southern opinion on this one, and it actually ended up being a six-three decision. What, but they, what, wasn't it seven-two? Are you sure? I uh, am less sure now, but <laughs> I, was, I was pretty sure. I, I thought it was 6-3, but uh, we, we can double check on that one. Um, I thought it was 6-3, but it may have been 7-2. Either way, it's immaterial. Either way. Yeah, yep. and I'm not, yeah. I'm not trying to nitpick by any means. Oh, uh, no. No, that's totally fine. I, I, have, I, I, thought, I thought it was 6-3, but it might be 7-2. Now I'm thinking it's like 50-50 chance. Well, hey, and I, I hope that you would uh, always you know do me the kindness of correcting me if you know, is I get some little tiny factoid incorrect at, at some yeah, point. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I will definitely do that. Uh, so, but the, but they took it one step further. They didn't just stop at can Dred Scott even sue in the first place, and if he can sue, um, which uh, law are we going with, Minnesota or Missouri? Um, but what they also said was, okay, well, if you're bringing this suit to court, because one of the arguments for many of the Southerners at this time was the Fifth Amendment argument. That was, that was the idea. And that is due process if you're going to take away someone's property rights. And so the argument was – and this is such a twisted argument, but you can see the legal – argument from it. Southerners at this time argued quite a bit. John C. Calhoun would just like walk around reciting the Fifth Amendment um, in support of slavery. And if you, you slave, now give me this image of the tall, lanky John C. Calhoun just like pacing through yeah, the Capitol with, with that <laughs> southern, reciting. with that southern draw, <laughs> yeah, like looking like a crazy person. If you've ever seen a picture of this guy, he looks like a crazy person. Um, <laughs> it's not like, the post flatter. Yeah, yeah, the, the, yeah. I know the like, photo you're talking about. Have you yeah. seen it? If you've been to the Capitol, I'm sure you have. The U.S. Capitol, you're, mm -hmm. you're close enough. Um, the statue of him that's that's in the Capitol. It, I don't know. It, it really, um, it just took me aback a little bit the first time I saw it. It really captured almost his his intensity as well. The the way he was depicted. Uh, anyhow, yeah, yeah. Know. It's yeah, and you're right. By the way, it was seven to two vote. So good job. Yeah. Oh, well, you, you're correct. You're correct. Very good. Way be on top of it. Um, but uh, you'll, you'll catch me later. It's OK. Yeah, I'm sure. Um, but the the so anyway, the Fifth Amendment is what they kept arguing because they said, well, if slaves are property and the federal government cannot take away my right to my property due to due process, 
then how is it that the federal government can determine that federal territories like the land gained in the Mexican-American War can't be slave territories? If slaves were property, then all federal territory is property, that is, is open to my property, which is a right. slave. And that argument won in the Supreme Court. Um, and, you know, the Supreme Court didn't have to take up that one. But I think part of them, they wanted to end it once and for all and just they be done, done with this issue. Right. And it's as weird as I think it might strike us today, I mean, the, the Tawny Court, or at least Tawny himself, uh, as I understand it, he genuinely thought that, yeah, this is going to finally put this ghost to, to bed. And, of course, it'd be putting it to bed in a favorable way you know, to slavery uh, way. And, you know, I don't know. I, I think in hindsight, it's, um, you know, it, it almost seems ridiculous to think really it, you make one decision at the Supreme Court, you think it's going to put to bed this this ghost that's haunted the nation since its in, inception. Um, but that, that was his conviction, yeah. uh, as I understand it. Yeah, it, and it was. And while there is a legal argument for it, and you can, you can, and I would do this when, when we, when I would teach about this, you can easily justify the legal perspective of Tawny and the other six justices who joined him. But the problem is, is when, when you read Tawny's decision and he says, quote, Negroes had for more than a century been regarded as beings of an inferior order, so far inferior that they had no rights that the white man was bound to respect. When you read that from a Supreme Court justice, all of a sudden the objectivity, the benefit of the doubt you'd like to give them for it goes out the window. Right. Um, and so what happens here after the Dred Scott decision African-American slaves in the United States of America realize that they are in trouble. They really lose hope outside of just literally escaping, which is difficult to do yeah. because of the, the, the strength and Fugitive well, Slave and, Act from the and, Compromise and, of 1850. And we need to talk about that. But yep. l- let me just add, Chris, um, that we should also remember that slaves have, su- slaves have successfully sued for their liberty. Mm-hmm. For, you know, I, I man, I don't remember the first case off the top of my head, but decades. I mean, basically going back to, again, you know, kind of the the, the start of the country. That's yep. it's something that's been done. So this, you know, and, and I mean, this is how law works, right? The Supreme Court makes a decision. Now the precedent's been set, and now that's how things go. Unless we have, uh, you know, another law or a, a U.S. Constitution amendment that will supersede that previous decision. So yeah. when Tawny's court says this, it it uh, tears away the ability of slaves really anywhere in the Union now, uh, even if they are in free territory, um, to be able to take their case to court and, uh, you know, <laughs> have any hope. Yeah. So, sorry, I didn't mean to derail no, again. But. No, no I, I, no, I think you're absolutely right. So it is it is a moment of hopelessness. It's yeah. a moment of hopelessness for African American free and slave all throughout the United States of America, and it's also a um, decision of anger and frustration for politicians like Abraham Lincoln. And in his House Divided speech, if you read it really closely, um, which I know you have, um, he's blasting the Kansas-Nebraska situation and the Dred Scott decision. He actually, and and you can see it is really subtle. But he says that that uh, Supreme Court case made, quote, Illinois a slave state. And what he means by that is that Dred Scott was taken to Illinois, which was a free state. Right. And so he's saying, so if you can't even come to a free state, my home state, if you can't come to my home state, which is a free state, and get freedom— then basically what you are now doing, Roger B. Tawney, and the United States Supreme Court is you are making us all complicit in this, yeah. and that is a problem. Um, and in that House Divided speech, he made it, Abraham Lincoln made it very clear that the country was going to go one way or another, and Southerners did not like to hear that because they knew exactly what he was implying with that. Well, and, and this is all, I think, you know, part of where— uh, I don't know. I wonder sometimes do do some people as they look back on Lincoln taking the presidency uh, look at the seceding states and think these guys are all bonkers. I mean, Lincoln's 
uh, inaugural speech, he clearly states that he's not going to prosecute slavery where it exists, where it's legal. He he's not going to take any fight to it. That he recognizes, as ugly as this is for us, you know, uh, truly, I, I hate to even ha- have to say this, but this is the fact that it was constitutionally, you know, permitted that mm-hmm. to, yeah. for slavery to to exist. Um, it, you know, and he recognizes that. Well, so why why does the South? kind of freak out and start seceding. I'm not saying that we lay all of that on the house divided speech, but, you, but I think it's fair to point to it at the very least. Lincoln has clearly identified, right? That a house divided cannot stand. Now he's the president. If you're dependent, you know, if you're, you've built yourself on, on a slave economy and now this man operates, you know, in the executive office of the federal government, um, you know, I, I guess I'm, I'm just, I'm trying to situate where the fear would be settling in and say yeah. South Carolina as they start all, uh, you know, d- deciding that they need to secede because the not abolitionist Republican has won the presidency. Yeah. And and I, th- I think more than anything else, it comes down to a handful of different reasons. Um, I, I mean, I, look, we can look at Abraham Lincoln and say he wasn't an abolitionist. We can look at all of his writings and his conversations, and we can say objectively, based on this data, it is it is impossible to argue he was an abolitionist when he was elected president. He made it very clear he wasn't. Now, right. um, whether or not he was politicking is a different story. And that um, is something we will debate until exactly you know, right <laughs> the and, end but, of humanity. And, and but but if you're a southerner. And you hear Abraham Lincoln make a speech like that, and you hear him talk about gradual emancipation. To many Southerners, gradual emancipation or not allowing slavery to sp- spread to the Western territories, in their mind, that was abolition. Right. Because eventually they can do the math, right? They can be like, wait, 17 Northern states, 18 Northern states, 19 Northern states. They can start counting on their fingers how uh-huh. many sla- slave states there will be represented in the House and the Senate and how many free states there will be. And once you get to a two-thirds supermajority, you can just amend the Constitution and get rid of slavery with a, signing, you know, a, a signature, and that's it. Yep. And they knew that. Additionally, while all the Northerners, Abraham Lincoln included, Promised them, and I shouldn't say all the Northerners. That's obviously an inaccurate generalization. But what? <laughs> but right, William Lloyd Garrison was not included in that. Frederick Douglass, right. nor was he. But while many Northerners, Abraham Lincoln included, promised that uh, they would not do anything to uh, take sla- the slave society away from the Southern states that already had it. Um, when you do the math in Congress. And on top of that, if you look at the border states, one real concern many slave states had is that eventually those border states will be slowly influenced by their northern neighbors. Um, Slavery will die down in those areas. Slaves will become less valuable. Those border states will likely sell the slaves back to the south because they can't sell them to the Caribbean because the slave trade is right. abolished. No international slave trade. Yep, exactly. Yep. Which Inter- is where inter- interstate slave trade, thriving. Yep, still thriving, unfortunately. I, yeah. I, la- I laugh a nervous laugh, not an actual funny laugh. Yeah, yes. yeah, I still, know. Still thriving. And so they'd have to sell them to the South, which means that the value of Southern slaves would go down. And it would mean that there would be a much higher volume of slaves, African-American to white American population. And many of these Southerners were constantly in fear of a slavery insurrection. It was like a racial powder keg down there. Yeah. And that's the last thing they wanted. And in, so, in fact, you know, a little bit of a throwback. I mean, you know, I'm I'm a revolution fanboy, especially, right? Yes, um, I mean, I'm the, aware. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just a little bit. Um, you know, that's that's even part of where we saw in the North, where slaves were were f- much fewer in number, that uh, slave owners were far quicker to say, "Hey, I will, um, you know, p- permit you to have your freedom if you will fight for the patriot cause." And so we have thousands of African Americans that are fighting for the Patriots in the North. They're earning their freedom in fighting. Um, whereas in the South, with the far larger enslaved population, I mean, Virginia is like 40% uh, you know, enslaved black American during the, the revolution. Slave owners are terrified to hand their guns 
to their slaves uh, because of that, uh, you know, th- that balance. And it's part of where Britain, as we mentioned earlier, you know, uh, thought to itself, ah, here's the ticket. We will, um, you know, will offer freedom to slaves in the South where these rebellious colonists aren't willing to do it. Yeah. Uh, so sorry to, you know, <laughs> sidetrack. No, but... no, no, I think I think that's a great point. And even when South Carolina does secede, they make it very clear. It's interesting. It's like a game of chicken, right? Abraham Lincoln saying, please don't secede. We're not going to abolish slavery. And South Carolina says, well, we're seceding, but we don't want to leave. Right. And, and what, they're, what they're basically saying is like, let's, um, let's figure this out right now. Like, we're not letting this go because there were a lot of Southerners who said, well, just give Lincoln four years, see what happens in the election of 1864, um, uh, especially many in the Georgia legislature, which almost did not succeed. Uh, succeed, secede, secede, because yeah. uh, so many northern Georgians in the mountain areas didn't own slaves, so they didn't want to secede. And you know, Tennessee falls into the same. Sure, same well, issue, in v- Virginia, right? right? And yep, Virginia, geez, same the thing, right? They hold out till after Fort Ukraine Sumter. Yep, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and uh, and Maryland, same, same with Maryland. I mean, Maryland may have seceded, but Lincoln, you know, didn't let that happen. No, he did um, not. He, and... he made he he made sure he didn't let that happen. Yeah. Um, but but what would you come to find is that these Southerners, they see the writing on the wall. They know, yeah, maybe it, it won't be abolished in Lincoln's presidency, but we're not going to win the next presidential election. You could have combined the votes from Stephen A. Douglas um, and John Be- – you could, you could have combined the votes from the other three presidential candidates that right. ran against Abraham Lincoln. And Abraham Lincoln still would have won the presidency comfortably. Which is a very strong message, right? Because yes. he's not getting a single electoral vote from the South. No. That is all Northern electoral He wasn't votes. even on the ballot in 10 Southern states. So you can combine the votes from Breckenridge, Douglas, and Bell, and Abraham Lincoln still would have won comfortably. So if you're a Southerner and you're sitting down and you're having a genuine conversation about the future of your society, right, the future of your livelihood, of your family's business, um, of your state, It's really difficult to come up with an optimistic viewpoint, like any type of argument or perspective that can lead to the extension, expansion, and lasting um, lifespan of the institution of slavery because they're going to lose um, a huge majority in both the Senate and the House over time. They are now, in their minds, powerless to elect a president who will um, protect and represent their interest, and they know that while cotton is extremely valuable, that's really the only leverage they have, and it's not going to be enough. Um, Now, here, if if you feel this derails, Chris, by all means, you know, say hit pause because you have other things you like to say in this arena, but I think it's fascinating. All these valid, you know, fantastic points that you've made, things that we've talked about, I mean, it's... um, you know, it's it's clear really as day, uh, and I know we I've made this point at, you know plenty of times on uh, on history that doesn't suck. I'm sure that these are things you're you're going to be getting to, in in the future. You, you know that what a massive you know main cause slavery is to the Civil War, and yet once the war breaks out, you know Frederick Douglass makes this point. I remember quoting him at some point in an episode. It's like both sides just sweep the whole thing under the rug. And again, people um, in, in the present sometimes, you know, act as though it's only the South that didn't want to talk as much about slavery being the, the impetus of the war. The North is just as happy to pretend that slavery, you know, isn't a factor. Um, yeah, as, as they marshal men, it's about fighting to preserve the Union and no one wants to kind of look deeper underneath and, and talk about what that fissure is and why there's a fight, you know, to, to keep the union together. Yeah. And, and I think a lot of that is strategic. Um, and a lot of that is political. Absolutely. Because when you think about it, if you're if you're trying to convince northerners to fight for a cause and you're a northerner who lives in, you know, Rhode Island and yeah. you've literally you're you're a 22 year old guy, you've literally never met a slave. Um, you've never seen slavery in action, not like not like you have in the South, and you're saying, okay, go take up arms so we can end slavery. 
I was like, oh, no. Right. Man, well, I, like, and I, 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 mean, I, I mean, my life in Rhode Island is pretty good. I, I'm not sure what's going on <laughs> down there. Like, my right. buddy read Uncle Tom's Cabin, and he told me it's pretty messed up, but I don't know. That's yep. like, that's a and, big and, risk. And at the same time, he'll also be saying, but, you know, my uh, my other you know, my friend who's who went to the South this one time, he said he went down there and wasn't anything like that novel. Yep. So, you know, it, mm-hmm. you know y- you've got, uh, I mean... You know, Uncle Tom's Cabin, uh, Salma Northup's autobiography. There are a lot of people yep. who read these and went, no way. No, that's just crazy talk. You know, that this can't be real. It's it's all being stretched. Uh, yeah. You know, you know, these are these are views that are held in the North. But I think more than that, e- even then, we I guess the thing that's really, um, you know, it, as I reflect on some, some of the the greater nuances that I've captured in some of the recent episodes that we've done is. um you know, realizing how unenthusiastic many Northerners, uh, you know, I mean, Democrats just across the board, zero interest in in ending uh, slavery. Uh, you know, the Democrats are split themselves between the the Copperheads, as they're called, uh, basically, mm-hmm. you know, seen as traitors, right? Yep. That uh, are totally opposed to to the war on any basis, really. Uh, then you've got the War Democrats, but they're they're only willing to fight to preserve the Union. You know, I mean, George uh, McClellan, our our buddy, little Mac, he, <laughs> he he's a Democrat and here he is, you know, leading the uh, uh, leading the U.S. Army at one point, you know, even the, the general in chief. Uh, the guy is not opposed to slavery, um, yeah. you know, at, at all. So uh, I, I guess I just I find the myths that um you know that develops so fascinating and how quickly they they settle in you know it's not like we got a few decades down the road and then um the impetus of of slavery and its its paramount role within the civil war was was then forgotten i mean it's 1861 and the politics are such that even in the north we're kind of trying to you know the union's trying to tamp down. Well, you know that this is this is about preserving the union. We're we're not going to talk so much about slavery. While Frederick Douglass is kind of scratching his head, going, "Are you kidding me? How how is this not? How is this not yeah. being discussed? This is blowing my mind." Yeah, of course, again, and, he and, said it way more eloquently than I did. But yeah, and right, and of course it is. It is. I said it a, a, a ways back in this episode. It's a rich man's war and a poor man's fight. In order to get the poor man to fight, you have to give the poor man a reason why it is in his best interest to risk his life to fight. And usually if you bring up the bigger, broader issues at hand that don't affect him immediately and personally, right. then you're going to have a difficult time recruiting people and keeping uh, keeping the war effort going. But, I mean, make no mistake, Alexander Stevens, who was the vice president of the Confederacy, said in 1861, um, quote, American Negro slavery is the cornerstone of the revolution. As a race, the African is inferior to the white man. Subordination to the white man is his normal condition. He is not his equal by nature and cannot be made so by human laws and human institutions. Our system, therefore, in regards to this inferior race, rests upon this great immutable law of nature. That is the vice president of the Confederacy at the outbreak of the Civil War. I mean, they were not mincing words about it. Right. Uh, to the South, it was about slavery. But to the North, it was about whatever they need to <laughs> what, do yeah, to, to, to get, get the men, men to fight the so field. they could— the end justifies the means, right? Um, you know, in, in the end, and and it absolutely did, right? Obviously, it absolutely well, did, it, and we it, see it this did. with American wars today, right? Like we send soldiers, and my brother, um, you know, I have family who fought in in the war in Iraq, and and you have you have uh, Americans who recently have, are still fighting in Afghanistan and fought in the Gulf War, and you know Vietnam. I mean, gosh, you'll, you'll get to that before I do, but. <laughs> Right. And it it is like we have a strategic interest in fighting this war for our nation, but we have to spin it in a way where each individual will feel compelled to put their lives on the line to make it happen. Um, and, and that that happens in every war. Well, and then the Emancipation Proclamation really endangers that narrative. Yeah, absolutely. And, and as you know, Lincoln was beside himself 
deciding whether or not to issue it and how to phrase it. And, oh, yeah. I mean, he, he, he was a classic self-torturer, and uh, he definitely did fell over the Emancipation Proclamation. The, his his self torture, you know, in yeah, as you very accurately put it, that poor man, the misery of his life. Yeah, um, it's. I guess it paid off, for lack of a better way to put it. I mean, he. I look at the the dance that this, that this you know, poor man had to do uh, between you know, trying to deal with. Um, everything from Copperhead Democrats to the war Democrats to anti-slavery Republicans who aren't really, you know, still sold on abolition to, you know, abolitionists. This is not an easy coalition to balance. And, you know, he's, he's where he's at because he didn't embrace abolitionism, you know, too soon to put that in just too, in a painfully clear realpolitik sort of way, you know, uh, to now he's, he's trying to, to, uh, to hold all of this together um, I, I do not envy him. I'll leave it. Yeah. That, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, when he, so, so obviously we know he wins the election in 1860 and he made something very clear when the Palmetto Republic as South Carolina called itself right. seceded from, from the United States of America. Um, he wanted to make sure everyone in the Republican Party, like you mentioned, he was dealing with so many different factions, so many different interests. Um, he wanted to make sure in that moment, he made no public appearances in that interregnum period from when he won the election in November to when he took office in March. But privately, he made very clear to everyone that um, ex- the expansion of slavery in the West is off the table for discussion. That is our platform. It does not expand into the West. It has always been our platform. This is why we formed as a party in the first place. No amount of pressure from these southern states is going to get us off of that. Um, And I think that set the tone for the next five years of his presidency um, in that he held firm right there at the very beginning. He held firm that uh, we're not kicking this can down the road anymore. Right. Um, uh, like um, Thomas Jefferson's quote, it was like, like a death bell in the night, you know, woke me with terror, something like that, right? When he thought about slavery and what he could do when they kicked it, the can down the road in 1820. Yeah. And Abraham Lincoln was putting his foot down, and he was saying, we're not going to do this anymore, right? Um, what you ignore becomes more, what you tolerate will take over, and what you challenge will change. And it's time to challenge it, and it's time to change it, and hopefully we can do it in the most peaceful way possible. I'll say, Obviously, though, you know— yeah. it, it, an interesting, I'm not a huge fan of counterfactual history, but you kind of get sucked into doing it every once in a while yeah, anyway. Yeah, uh, I get it, yeah. You know, if the Union had been as successful as it thought it would be at the beginning of the war, you know, might that can have gotten kicked if if this civil war turned out to just be a quick rebellion and, you know, the, the, the CSA was quickly folded back in? Uh I mean, to to me, I think there's there's plenty of space to read um, a a version of U.S. history in which the uh, the the abolitionists are again sidelined, the uh, Democrats and you know anti-slavery but not abolitionist Republicans, you know who who aren't going to fight as as hard on it, you know are are happy to avoid war and simply welcome back in the the slave states. Um, you know, f- figuring once again, oh, you know, this this is just going to sort itself out in time. I don't know. You, you have any that, thoughts no, on that? No, no, yeah. That, I mean, that that certainly could have happened. That's not something I think about often. So I actually I like counterfactuals. They're fun. Oh, but, do you? Um, but yeah, but but that I guess I've, something... I've just been asked some very crazy ones in the classroom. Yeah, like, no, know, I can I, I can see that. I can <laughs> see that. Yeah, uh, there. Um, there certainly is that possibility. I, w- I would think, though, from the perspective that we have now and the knowledge that we have now about it, um, if there is some type of session uh, piece at the end of a shortened war, um, it will be done with knowledge, uh, with the South now having knowledge of what their fate is. Now, sure. that doesn't mean that there won't be future conflict or another war on top of that, the Second Civil War, who knows, right, whatever right. it would be, the Second Civil Rebellion, 
whatever they would have called it. Right. But at least then it would have been very clear, like, you made your play and you lost. Sure. And this is how it's going to be moving forward. And for a, a very brief period of time after the war, prior to Lincoln's assassination, um, that's sort of what ha- that's what happened. Now, granted, they they lost the war; it was a much bigger war, et cetera. But that's what happened. I mean, the South wasn't happy with the results of the Civil War, um, and they did not want to come back into the Union. Uh, many of them, a few of them, took a, a couple of years to come back in, but they realized that they couldn't survive without it. Um, they didn't have a choice. Well, I might also say though, you know, just just as my wheels are turning and kind of thinking this through. Uh, in a way, e- even if it had been a truncated, you know, rebellion, and uh, and, and peace had been obtained quicker, and you know, we we didn't get an, a thirteenth, fourteenth, and fifteenth amendment as immediately as we did. How differently does would that alternate world look from Jim Crow, or yeah. you know, it, it, is it pretty similar? Uh, because you know, of course, now we're getting, we're pushing past even where I'm at, and mm-hmm. but you know, we'll we'll get to that rather quickly. And um, you know, some some listeners are already very familiar with how Reconstruction fails, and others are, you know, it's um, I, I take I take no pleasure in, uh, you know, discussing some of these uh, painful parts of our history, but you know, we've we got to discuss them. They're they're crucial. Um. You know, I've I've heard uh, some historians kind of say the Union won the war, but then the Confederacy kind of won the aftermath. Yep. Um, well, yeah, I mean, you, you can certainly argue that uh, yeah. for for sure, because what what ends up happening is, you know, I, I would talk to my classes about this, like, let's just be real here. Like, let, let's just be honest. OK, so you're a slave in the Mississippi River Valley. Right. And say you're a slave down in Jackson, Mississippi, and the war is over. Right. And you have no money and you have uh, no food and you have no clothing and you have no education and you have no real marketable skills. Uh, You don't know where Mississippi is. You don't know where any other state is. Right. You're not literate Um, because it was illegal to be literate. You're not literate. And uh, don't forget this vagrancy laws, which means you weren't allowed to just like walk on the road and go somewhere. Um, you had to actually be on a piece of property at certain times during the day in certain counties, et cetera. So they actually created laws that made it illegal for freed African Americans to even move north. And so then you're stuck back in the same exact situation. Um, and that it and what happens is Reconstruction was a failure, and it was a failure because they did not challenge that enough, and they didn't force it to change. And, I mean, it continued for, for decades and decades. You have um, lynchings of African Americans in Minnesota in the 1920s. Right. This is after World War One. They're having illegal vigilante lynchings of African Americans. You have— you have murders of, of African Americans in which the uh, the men the white men who murdered murdered them admit to it in court and they're still found not guilty. They admit to it. They brag about it and they're found not guilty. So well, I mean, yeah, well, yeah. I mean, this is and, and now we're now we're getting way down the yeah, path. Yeah, I mean, and, and, geez, yeah, we'll, we'll, get to, we'll get to I'll Emmett re- Till, you know, in, even yeah. in the 1940s. Yeah, Emmett Till. Yeah, right? absolutely. That's what I'm thinking of. Yeah, yeah. In the 1940s. Yeah. So, <laughs> well. Um, that is again nervous laughter because I guess that's where we end up. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's it's um, you know, it, it's a lot. It's a lot to think about. It's a it lot is. to take in. It's yeah. a lot to discuss. But I think I, I think it's it, it's a fascinating topic in that it really forces you to explore um, just how much of an impact slave the slave society. I mean, the southern. States in the United States of America were one of the largest slave societies in the history of the world. I mean, you're talking about um, ancient Greece is up there, um, ancient Rome, but southern United States, there were very few societies that were steeped so heavily in in slavery like the southern United States was. It impacted every single 
aspect of the society. And when you look at stuff like that and you wonder, hold on a second, how did this happen? How did it continue to happen? Um, how did it lead to war? After the war, what did they do about it? Because that's a lot of reversing you have to do. Right. And when you do that, you're going to push a lot of people out of their comfort zone. How do you deal with that? Um, and then what does that lead to the certain um, – how does that lead to the certain things that we, we see today, right? Just in, just in clear demographics, right? African-Americans um, have about 2% of the wealth in the United States of America, right? Like – that that's not that's not on accident, right? All of this stuff, conti- these conversations continue to play into what we deal with today, right? And of course, each individual is responsible for his or her own fate. But as as a society, um, we are what we are because of our past, right? The- right, J- just like as individuals, we are who we are today because of our past. And as a country, we are what we are now because of our past. And the better we understand it, the better we can understand how we got to where we are today. Which allows us to figure out how are we going to get better as right. we move forward. Well, and I mean, one of the the things, I guess, to to maybe tap into my sapier side for a minute, as we've gotten super heavy here, <laughs> uh, you know, th- that I I love about our our foundational documents is the idea of a more perfect union, right? It, the yep. that um, one the the, the founders acknowledging the lack of perfection in it. And I love the promise in that, the idea that we are striving to become better. And, yeah. and you know, that, that is the, the beauty of understanding and studying and learning our nation's history. Sometimes it's super uncomfortable, you know, uh, it, it, mm-hmm. and um, sometimes there are things that make, make a, a little Patriot heart go pitter patter. And other times it, it breaks th- those hearts. Um, and, uh, but we can't progress without understanding all of those things. You know, we, we, yeah. we, we don't have the luxury of, um, of just isolating ourselves on, on one side of those polemics. Uh, we have to take it all in so we can better understand, you know, not just our own lives and our, but the lives of our fellow Americans, um, and, 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 you know, get where they're coming from, um, why they're where they're at, why we're at, mm-hmm. where, why we are where we are at. Um, and and yeah. uh, anyhow, I mean, th- these are all reasons why I'm, I'm passionate about us understanding our, you know, everything from, from our intellectual t- to uh, philosophical histories, uh, you know, social histories, it, it's all got to be brought to the table. Yeah. And, and I think there's also that, um, and, and I totally agree with you. It, and it is, um, it, it's so insightful when when you think about it that way, and um, it, it forces insight. That's really what I'm looking for. It forces insight when when you look more and more into it. And I think that for for the United States of America, for me, when th- throughout doing this podcast and from my my decade teaching U.S. government um, and U.S. history and, and studying it. Um, you know, I'm no PhD like you, Greg. So oh. you know, I, I didn't go. I didn't go that far. I didn't sell my soul to academia quite that much. But, um, <laughs> but uh, it, it perhaps speaks to greater wisdom, sir. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Maybe that's the case. Maybe. Um, but but what you what I think is really important, and I would try and do this with my students. And it was really hard because it's an incredibly fine line of recognizing. The societal structure that we live in today, the societal limits potentially that certain individuals have to deal with today, um, why that's the case. I mentioned, you know, African Americans having such a low percentage of the net worth. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, you can't see me with, on this podcast, but I'm, I'm white. I'm a white American. Um, my father went. I, I, I went to a university that wasn't particularly cheap. My father went to a university that wasn't particularly cheap. Uh, my grandfather went to a university that wasn't particularly cheap. My great-grandfather did, right? So I can easily trace this back and say, okay, my great-great-grandfather um, went to we, – we're basically a family of Georgetown Hoyas for the most part. And okay. it's like, it's like, okay, so look at what was in my family generation after generation – um, 
that provided the springboard that I had when I was younger, right? Yeah. So recognizing that and knowing that um, there are people with this and there are people without and that these generations over time, um, it is extremely difficult to get yourself out of difficult situations. So recognizing why we are in the situations we're in today while still also maintaining that um, accepting of victimhood just for the sake of accepting it is not helpful, right? It's not empowering. And so it's that delicate balance of recognizing that, yes, this situation was created by past wrongs that were done to um, family members or people of your race or people of your geographic region um, or people of your religion, right? People of your ethnicity. Yes, absolutely. And that and that's why um, the, you endure these challenges today. And, and hearing that, making space for that while also saying, but you have the power to do something about it now, today. You can be that change for, for you. You can be that change for future gener- generations for your family, right? Just like so many other people's fathers and grandfathers were for their families. Um, because but while I, I come from a line of four or five generations of, of you know, people who could afford an education, um, my great, you know, uh, the one like five or six back was an immigrant who had nothing, right? Sure. And, and he had to make it. And then he created um, a better life and a better standard of living for future generations. So I think that that, that – but that's such a delicate balance, right? And that's so difficult and that's so personal and so yeah. individual yes, to each it person. Is. Those are a lot right? of very, very difficult uh... – Yeah, they are. But, but, but that's the stuff like that's real. Like that's real conversation and that's real life and that's – truly understanding and and just loving and appreciating history and the nuance to it yeah and how we get to where we are and how we get to where we want to go um because the more time we spend thinking about why we are where we are as opposed to where we could be is time that we can't spend trying to get to where we could be and yeah. uh i say that if to individuals and and to us as a nation um, well, and it, I think it's crucial for us to think of that as a nation. I mean, one of the, uh, you know, I, um, I, I'd say one, one of the most Im- important things that, um, you know, it's, it's an election year, right? Things are, are already, uh, you know, every, everyone's Twitter or whatever it might be yay. is already getting filled with. <laughs> with uh you know the different sides and whatnot mm-hmm. um yeah. it's uh but you know when i think about um some of my uh some of my american heroes you know it is as trite and commonplace as it sounds it, it through my deep study george washington abraham lincoln they're both pretty high on the list mm-hmm. and these are these are both men who were capable of of thinking and seeing people you know, beyond their own, their own cadre, you know, people, um, again, I think in, in, in the present often forget these are the two premier presidents who brought people into their cabinet who had different perspectives, you know, Hamilton and Jefferson, good grief. Who, who wants to put those two in the same room or, you know, to Lincoln and his, as Goodwin, you know, her, her book, team of rivals, team of rivals right? Yeah. Like, uh, you know, uh, the um the, the willingness to think of americans who um you know who 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 are your fellow americans uh, just because you haven't you know walked in their shoes doesn't mean you can't study and learn from them and and better understand each other and maybe have a better discourse and perhaps that's one of the more important things we can remember this upcoming year yeah yeah and and, and knowing history and yeah. understanding it builds well, that's, bu- building building that understanding also builds empathy ex- yes because you precisely. get it. you you understand you get where they're coming from you understand their perspective you understand why um the the country is the way it is and what's happened in the past that's worked and and hasn't worked right yeah and um you know those leaders that you mentioned one thing i i was i was musing on just the other day um, when I was thinking about my, my job, I'm not teaching anymore. So, so I'm, I, uh, I have a team in my office that, that I, I manage. And, um, and I was thinking about the idea then what makes guys like Washington and Lincoln, 
um, so great, right, is that they saw people for how those people wanted to be seen. Um, and that that's such a powerful, powerful tool for right. any leader, um, for any person to person, right? Yeah. If if when when people speak to you about their issues or their problems or their self limiting beliefs, if you see them for how they want you to see them, and you speak to them and treat them how they want you to see them, um, it, it's very empowering. And, and those two guys were great at that. And I think that's the American spirit, right, is yeah. that we see as Americans, we see this country, we see each other how we want to be seen more often than I think sometimes we give ourselves credit for. And uh, In many ways, isn't yeah. that kind of the American dream? You know, we are um, – our, our willingness to envision something greater than what actually looks back at us in the mirror and, and, and aspiring to, to continue that, that tradition generation after generation and, you know, and, and hopefully becoming better at wishing that for, you know, for all of our fellow Americans. Uh, and, yeah. and you just can't do that without history. I mean, you, you said empathy that just really strikes a chord with me. I mean, uh, to me, it's the most, and I guess we're we're at a very deep point, at least you know on on history that doesn't suck as as we're in the depths of of the Civil War, you mm-hmm. know, um, and you know we touched on so many things that <laughs> that we'll get to from Reconstruction well into the 20th century, um, you know, uh, d- empathy for uh, just empathy for each other, uh, and it comes yep. through the study of history, and uh, I mean that that's got to be one of one of the primary reasons I'm so passionate about history. I I like to truly under try and understand as much as I possibly can what it is to walk in someone else's shoes, um, whether those you know whatever state uh, or race you name it you know it might be. That's that's how we build a better future. Is, yeah. is, is that it, is that a sappy note there to to close on, Chris? No, no. I mean, because in in the end, what what happens is when you study American history, you realize that we are living in the Arguably, right, first century Rome, um, please forgive me, but we're living <laughs> arguably the greatest society in the history of the world, and we have the highest standard of living ever in the history of the world. And right. we, we, for the record, unless you're, you know, hundreds of years old, were born into that. We were born into that. Yeah. And we stand on the shoulders of giants who have come before us. And uh, the sooner we recognize that we, in between our ears, are responsible for our own success, but we need other people to do it, mm-hmm. then— That important tension. The, yep, that important tension. We, I am responsible for my own success in life, yet the car I drive was not made by me. The clothes I wear were not made by me. The house I live in was not built by me. The HVAC system that heats my house was not built by me. Uh, the phone I used was not built by me. Nothing in my life. Like, the, I don't even brush my own teeth because I didn't make my toothbrush or the toothpaste. So, like, I don't, like, other than breathe, like, there are very few things I literally do all by myself. And so I think having that empathy and having that understanding that, like, we are in an incredible time right. in human history, and we are so damn lucky to be here. And... um Look at what we can do and think about the positives and think about the great people who have come before us and emulate them and just stay positive and keep focusing on that and keep diving into American history and learning more about it. Um, And I I think that's – I don't know. I'm off my soapbox now. We've gotten really (laughs) deep here, and this is what happens when you get two two U.S. history nerds just like talking. And I'm all wired. It's like after midnight here on the East Coast, so I'm getting into like crazy tired. So uh, you know, right, (laughs) right. For Dave. Well, um, I I feel like that's probably good conversation, man. It is. This is probably a good natural point to to go ahead and wrap it up, and and maybe let you let you get some sleep. Um, Yeah. (laughs) So, (laughs) but Chris. Thank you. I mean, you know, it's it's always fun to um, be able to have these these conversations with, you know, someone else who who has a deep understanding and of of course, you know, uh, just fo- be able to follow thoughts and into into directions that um, maybe we didn't even anticipate going. I feel that could probably yeah, be yeah, said we for do, half yeah, of what, yeah, in, in, what happened in our here. Per- 
in our production mm-hmm. meme, we did not plan out all these rabbit holes, but I think they're important to tease out. And, you know, this is a bonus ep- episode for you and your audience. And we talked about, like, it's difficult to tie it in directly with the timeline, but there are some bigger cultural and societal themes that we could touch on that that we thought would bring some value to both your audience and mine. So yeah. I really appreciate you having me on the show. Um, uh, and, and we've now both been on each other's shows, which is awesome. And we're both basically doing the same thing with our own flavor, which is really cool. Well, and, um, and that's uh, trying to teach people the history of the U.S. And I'll, I'll uh, just, again, in closing, want to say um, check out Chris's podcast. It's, uh, if, if you'd like to get another flavor go go a layer deeper on on some of these things and you you cover the colonial era which i do, I do not do yeah i, I pick up with so George all, all you colonial all you colonial history nerds out that's there, right <laughs> you can check it out okay um, and again that so is yeah. a teacher's history of the united states uh yep chris uh, where can people you know find it follow you and all that yeah so i'm on everywhere podcast are available um I'm pretty sure. <laughs> um, uh, I'm uh, on Twitter at a teacher's hist and Facebook a teacher's history of the United States um, podcast. And uh, so, so yeah, like you mentioned, we go we we go a couple cuts deeper um, than you do, and we we explore uh, some things in more detail. And I opine a little bit, but um, you know, I try to keep it as objective as possible, just like you do, because. Um, you know, it's it's up to the listener to make their determinations on on how they want to and feel comfortable interpreting our history. Amen to that. Absolutely. It, yep. Let uh, get get critical thinking skills out there uh, and let let people govern them. You know, govern themselves. Think of their own views. That's the hope. Yes. All right. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Greg. I really appreciate it, man. Hey, it was a lot of fun. My pleasure. And uh, of course, join me. Uh, join me next time, where I'd like to tell you a story.